Well, since we're getting ready to start work on a new project car, it is time to detune the Silverado. Stick around. Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by the garage and I just want to take a moment as always to thank all the new subscribers out there. Thank you for all the thumbs up. Thanks for all the support over on the Patreon. You can find a link to that down in the description. And if you have been following us on our Instagram, you would know that we have a new project car, the Cadillac XLR. Picked it up. It is actually in the shop back there right now. We're getting ready to start work on that. We hit a roadblock, uh, but I will go into that a little bit at the end of this video. For now, we're looking at the Silverado. As you can see, the supercharger is gone. We're gonna kinda of tame this thing down a little bit. We don't need all that power. We're gonna focus on the XLR, and we're gonna make this thing a little bit more usable for everyday life before we go and put it in storage for the rest of the winter. That being said, that means we need to detune it. So let's get into what all needs to be changed whenever you do something like take forced induction off of a vehicle. Okay, so I have got the most recent tune for the Silverado pulled up, and as a compare file, I have opened up a uh, 2015 stock file. I don't have the apps found. That was like three laptops ago. I might be able to find it, but for now, we're just gonna go off of a stock file. What are some of the things that we're gonna need to change? Well, as long as the intake ducting size does not change, which in this case it did not because I'm literally just adding a filter to the end of my IC charge pipe. The intercooler has been pulled out, all that stuff, but where the pipe was coming out of the throttle body and going down to the intercooler, I've disconnected it there, thrown a filter on there, left the math in place. So the mass airflow sensor is good already. We don't need to make any adjustments on that in order to get it to work. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the volumetric efficiency table. Now the volumetric efficiency table is a beast of a different nature and there's a couple reasons why. One of them being that if you were on a boosted platform beforehand, uh, you were going above 1.0 on the map or 1.0 on your pressure ratio depending on how your table is set up. That is no longer going to be the case. Now that we're going back to naturally aspirated, we're going to max out at 1.0. But that being said, that doesn't mean that we were not seeing the effects of forced induction below 1.0. So what you're gonna see on the volumetric efficiency table is that there's a chance that you are going to have leaner cells or cells that need to be dialed in leaner below that 1.0 area where you were getting that artificial inflation of pressure and the engine's not gonna be that efficient anymore. That's what the whole thing is, is a map of the efficiency of the engine, how well it can breathe air. Well, whenever you've got a snail or a blower on the front end of that, the thing breathes air a lot better because we're shoving it down its throat. That being said though, remember on dynamic airflow, uh, the VE table is predominantly in the lower RPMs. Above a certain RPM, we go into what is called high speed, which is the filtered mass airflow uh, measurement only. And because of that, we're probably all right, but it's something that we might have to take a second look at, may have to go out, do some dialing back in. We still have modifications on this vehicle, like a modified intake manifold, throttle body, things like that. So we can't just set this back to stock, unfortunately. But I don't think that that's gonna be a, a, an issue. Where it's gonna be an issue is probably on the timing tables, but in a good way. So now that we're looking at the timing tables, you'll notice that they're pretty low. And that's because on a forced induction vehicle, you've got so much additional cylinder pressure in there, you have to run less advanced. So we're actually going to be able to pick more timing up. And for a uh, starting location, we're gonna go ahead, go in there and copy the stock high octane table back in and then we'll keep an eye on that whenever we go out and log for the first couple drives. To copy over, we're just gonna go into the difference table, zero it out, which effectively will make the uh, live table match the comparison table. There we go, now we have a modified timing table where we picked up a little bit more timing and wide open throttle, and so as I said, we'll keep an eye on that whenever we go out for the initial drive. Let's jump over to what is really important though, the torque stuff. As you can see, we've modified a lot of the torque tables because of the supercharger on this. Not only have we modified the torque tables, but we've also modified the driver demand tables, things like that. So the easiest way of doing this is to go into the comparison view, find all the torque values that we want to get rid of, and just use it to copy that stuff over. Let me see if I can pull the laptop over here, and I will do it live so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, as we come in here, we're going to go into compare, view comparison log. 
There's a lot of stuff on here that we're not going to want to mess with, so we'll skip over it, such as RPM. Uh, idle speed control reserve, we can update that. So we'll select it, copy over selected differences. Now it matches the stock one. Airflow, we're going to leave the same for now. Dynamic airflow, we'll leave. In fact, we can just close all of airflow. We'll take a look at fuel right now. It's just stoic stuff that's been changed because of the flex fuel tune on there. So pretty much all of this should be able to stay the same. And in fact, after we're done, we can probably go in and lean out power enrichment because we don't need to run quite as, uh, quite as rich under PE because we are now in a uh, non-forced induction setup. Spark, we've already made those adjustments and here's the torque model. So we're gonna go ahead and copy all of the torque coefficients over. Now on the torque limits, we don't necessarily want to change all of these. The peak engine torque, we might change that one because that is uh, directly related to the generation of torque on there. But as far as the rest of these limits, we can leave those maxed out. That's just part of torque management. So we don't necessarily want to reset those. But then on the driver demand tables, we do want to copy those over. Everything else underneath here is going to be transmission stuff. We'll get into that at a later time. But now that we've updated all that stuff, Let's go in, write the tune into the vehicle, and see if we can get it to start. Okay, now that we've got the new fly, file flashed in, the big question is going to be whether or not the thing starts up. So let's give it a shot. I'm pretty sure it will. No problem. I said maybe I spoke too soon. Let's see if it catches up here. I probably should have reset the fuel trims while I'm thinking about it. Yep, they're, they're falling in line now. We were running a little bit lean. I did not set, reset the long-term fuel trims after writing that file in. And so we might have a little bit of rough goings about here on this first drive, but let's go ahead and take it for a spin, see how it does, see if we run into any issues. Okay, as we get this thing warmed up into operating temp, we're gonna keep an eye on our wide band as usual. We're going to take it easy for now. We're just making sure that thing's going to run, and it seems to be doing pretty good so far. It's definitely going to be a little bit weird rolling into the throttle and not feeling the boost pick up, but... And we're definitely getting into power enrichment too early, so I'm going to need to adjust uh, when power enrichment comes back on, back to stock, because we do not want to be going into PE that low in the RPMs without boost behind it. Just some considerations that you need to take into account whenever you're doing something like detuning a vehicle from forced induction to naturally aspirated. All in all, I'd say we're off to a good start. Uh, you know, every vehicle is going to be a little bit different. So you kind of have to use uh, some forethought as to what would need to change based on your platform. If you go back and look at different tuning steps that you've done along the way, it gives you an idea of how to work your way backwards. If you've added additional mods along the way, like I have in this situation, you have to keep those in the forefront of your mind. The intake manifold and the throttle body could definitely cause you to get off into the weeds and cause issues with the tune. And it may be easier in some situations just to go back to your stock tune and start over uh, having removed stuff like that. And honestly, that was my initial thought process was to go back to stock, remember what all I needed to adjust for the intake manifold and the throttle body, but that would require me to go through, retune the map, which should not need to be done whenever you're going from forced induction to non-forced induction, and then uh, redial in the VE table, which the VE table down low on my truck is dialed in pretty well, and it shouldn't need to be adjusted down there. Now, I'm gonna look at it later on, see if the top end needs to be smoothed out some, and if so, I will, but we're never going to exceed the amount of air that we were beforehand, so the math is good. That's what's important. And we're just gonna go, kind of go from there. Maybe we'll pick up a little bit more on the spark side, as I said earlier. We'll dial that in eventually. But for now, we've got more important fish to fry, and that is the XLR. A short story behind that is I went out, bought a 2006 Cadillac XLR for an S project car because of the fact that they work on the E67 platform, which is often used on things like LS3 Corvettes. Come to find out that the 2006 year was a crossover year in which they had a different ECM before 2006, 2004, 2005, and then in 2006, the XLR still has the older style ECM, whereas the V switched over to the E67, and then 2007, eight, and nine, all of them were on that E67 platform. So we have an ECM that is not supported by any tuning software. The big thing about that is though, 
we also have a vehicle that has a different ECM in a later generation. So I've been working on the pinouts. I've got the ECM ordered already, the adapters that need to go in, all that stuff. We'll have to repin the harness. Not a big ordeal. It'll make some good content. So if you're interested in learning more about that, make sure and stick around as we dive into that in the upcoming weeks. We'll also touch on how to use the uh, SPS uh, service platform to go in, write a tune file or write the stock configuration file from GM into that used ECM because it's not going to have the proper config in there. It's probably out of a Trailblazer or an even a Corvette or something. But we'll go on to the AC Delco uh, TIS web download the configuration and hopefully we'll be able to use the VCX uh, DX Diag that I've talked about in the, the VCX Nano in the past and use it to write the config. If not, we'll uh, get our hands on a Tech 2 because this is a Tech 2 platform so we can write that in. Then after that we'll go in and do things like the VATS delete and change everything out that needs to be changed out. Some of the camshaft sensors are a little bit different. The rest of the sensors on the vehicle are the same. So uh, Then on top of it, the wide bands on the earlier platform uh, the front O2 sensors on the earlier platforms were actually wide bands, which is kind of mind blowing. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why they would go away from having wide bands other than the E67 doesn't support wide bands, but it kind of makes you wish that GM would have gone that way and started using wide bands from, on factory tunes like a lot of their competitors do. So we will actually have to take the wide bands out to install narrow bands to get it to work. But let's jump back in the garage and do a real quick wrap up. Okay, so that was just a real quick look at how to detune the vehicle. Basically walking back modifications that we've done on the vehicle, changing the tune to compensate for those changes and make it drivable again. A lot easier than tuning, isn't it? Well, you know, it's still not 100% complete, but the vehicle can get around. I can use it as a pickup truck now for the most part. Next, we probably need to move that fuel cell out of the back behind the axle so I have some bed space. But that's probably projects for next summer. For now, we've got that Cadillac XLR. Keep your eyes peeled. There's going to be a lot of content coming out on that. Hopefully by next weekend, we'll be diving into the ECM repin, stuff like that. So make sure to check it out. As always, if you have not hit the subscribe button, hit it, hit the like button. The live show is normally on Thursdays. This is Thanksgiving week this week that it's coming out. So we're going to do it on Wednesday, but I'll post in the comments or in the uh, community section about that. Other than that, I want to always thank everybody for all their support. Thank you for stopping by at the garage. Remember, ABT, always be tuning. Let's dive in.